Hi guys, so welcome back to my expert strategies for working with anxiety. Um, this is by Christine Padusky, uh, Rick Hansen, and Ruth Buzinski. So yeah, let's get into it. This is module three. Let's get into it. Expert Strategies for Working with Anxiety, Module 3. How to Transform a Client's Anxiety from Fear to Confidence. Dr. B. How could something that makes a client feel safe actually be, actually be a block to healing? According to Dr. Christine Padusky, what makes a client feel safe can often do very little to reduce their anxiety level. Here she shares one way to manage anxiety that can lead to a more lasting sense of security. Dr. Bresky. The first thing is to understand a simple conceptualization of anxiety. Anxiety disorders are when, so wait, con conceptualization, I don't know how to speak, obviously, of anxiety. Anxiety disorders are where CBT and Behavior therapy and cognitive therapy have really shown the best. We get such good treatment outcome, usually very quickly, with extremely low relapse rates. We're doing something right, and the cognitive model of anxiety can be described very simply. If you think of an equation where you have A equals, and A is anxiety, and then you have a ratio, and on top of the line of the ratio, you have ever overestimation of the danger, and on the bottom line, you have underestimation of coping and resources. Now, it is important to be anxious without our estimation of danger being greater than our estimations of our ability to cope or the resources available to help us cope. For example, if you were approaching a roller coaster, you might see there being a certain amount of danger, but if you think the safety me me mechanisms in place and your ability to cope with the thrill of the ride are great enough, you're going to feel excitement and not anxiety. But if you approach that roller coaster and you think there's danger there, and you've recently read about safety errors and roller coasters going off the tracks and this and that, and are thinking, oh my gosh, if that happens, I wouldn't know what to do. I, I don't know how to cope. You're going to feel anxious. So it's that relationship between estimations of danger, which we know when we get anxious, we tend to overestimate. And the closer we get to something we're afraid of, the more we overestimate danger, and we also, in dangerous situations, underestimate our ability to cope and the resources available to us. So that is kind of a framework for thinking about anxiety, because in terms of treatment methods, <clears throat> we can either work at reducing people's sense of danger, or we can work at increasing people's confidence that they can cope and awareness of resources that can help them. That's a general kind of model of working with anxiety. <clears throat> Excuse me. Dr. B, before we go any further, let's review the equation that Christine just shared. Anxiety equals an overestimation of a danger over an underestimation of coping and resources. Meaning, when we feel that the danger is too great for our ability to deal with it, that's when we get anxious. So, generally speaking, if we could change one var variable in that, in that equation, we can m mitigate the level of anxiety. It's not always that easy, though. Mitigate, M-I-T-I-G-A-T-E. Dr. Podesky. Now, the problem with anxiety is that there's two things. Sorry, it's not always that easy, though. Dr. Podesky. Now, the, now, the problem with anxiety is there's two things people do when they get anxious that maintain their anxiety. The first is avoidance. Sometimes I say there are four things. The first three are avoidance, 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 and the fourth thing is safety behaviors. Avoidance. We can see how that makes it hard to overcome anxiety because if you're, if you're afraid of something but you never approach it, then the fear of it can grow in your mind and you never learn that it's maybe not as dangerous as you think or that you're able to cope with it better than you think. And safety behaviors do the same thing. Safety behaviors describe those things we do to protect ourselves from what we believe is the danger. For example, if I have social anxiety and I think I make a mistake, people will criticize me that I may not be able to avoid all situations, all social situations. But when I'm in them, I adapt safety behavior. So if someone asks my opinion rather than risk making a mistake, I'll say, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? And I'll deflect it back to that person. 
Or if I'm in a work meeting and my supervisor is going around asking people for experiences, I may look down at my desk and avoid eye contact so that I don't get called on. By having, by having safety behaviors, people don't get a chance to learn that they can deal with what they're afraid of. That said then, the most effective strategies with working with anxiety are going to involve using lots of experiences in and outside of therapy to get people to approach what they're afraid of and practice and develop confidence that they can cope with whatever danger might really be there. But in order to do that, there is a previous step that you have to do. We have very different treatments for each of the anxiety disorders. What we do with panic disorder doesn't look at all like what we do with social anxiety, and it doesn't look at all like what we do with generalized anxiety disorder. We have to first know what type of anxiety we're dealing with, and in order to do that, we have to identify the specific thoughts and images that are driving the anxiety. And this can be hard to do. Sometimes this is the hardest part of anxiety treatment because when you say to someone who's anxious, what makes you so anxious in that situation? They'll often say, I don't know. I don't have any thoughts. <clears throat> or, okay, let's put you back in the situation. So when you were at the grocery store and you started to feel panicky, what was going through your mind? I don't know. I just left for store. The avoidance makes it very hard to figure out what the anxious person is anxious about. So, what we've learned over time through strategies and CBT is we put people in the situation either by recreating it in the office or by going through an, an imagination and then we, what I call, block the exit. I'll say to people, imagine you're back at the grocery store. You're starting to feel a little bit panicky. What are you feeling in your body? The person will start to tell me, I'll say, what's going through your mind? And they'll say, I just need to get out of here. Imagine you can't get out of there. Imagine the door is blocked. Imagine you have to stay. What's worst you can imagine will happen. Now, you notice I'm using words like imagination. I'm not saying, what are you thinking? And that's because the thoughts that drive anxiety are not necessarily word thoughts. They're very often images. And so we want to use words like, what's the worst you can imagine? And if they say something in words like, well, I might have a heart attack or people might see that I'm anxious and criticize me or think I'm weak, then I might say, do you have an image of that? What does that look like? What are you seeing? Are you hearing anything? Feeling anything on your skin? What's your experience? And I'll get them to describe their imagery in a multi-sensory way so that I can fully understand what the fear is about. Now, once you understand that fear, you're going to know more. You're going you're going to know more what anxiety disorder you're dealing with. That person having the panic in the grocery store, if they say, my heart's beating fast, I'm going to have a heart attack, I'm dying, that's classic for panic disorder. That's one of the classic presentations of panic. But if they say, but if they see people are going to notice something is wrong with me, I'm going to feel so embarrassed and humiliated, they're going to see that I'm anxious and judge me as weak, then that's classic for social anxiety. The content of their thoughts is going to guide us to a diagnosis, and then we're going to be able to move into the appropriate treatment methods for whatever the disorder is. Dr. B. As Christine explained, when a client is in the grip of anxiety, it's often images, not words, that we need to pay closest attention to. So next, let's look at how tinkering with the equation for anxiety led Christine to develop a new way to treat anxiety with one of her clients. Dr. Podesky. One client I worked with anxiety on was a 22-year-old woman who had severe social anxiety, and she was in therapy with me. And at the time, this was a number of years ago, at the time, I was doing what a lot of classic CBT was at the time, and was trying to convince her that most people weren't critical and rejecting because that's a central belief in social anxiety. People will criticize and reject me if I make mistakes or look foolish. Now, she was a college student, and I was trying to get her to do very simple experiments, such as when she was in class sitting next to someone. When she was in class sitting next to someone, have her just turn to someone and say hello or smile. I had zero success in getting her to do any of these experiments. And what I learned in talking to her is this test of dangerous beliefs. Dangerous beliefs working on the top half of the, of, the, uh, of the anxiety equation. 
Our social anxiety isn't very helpful because most people with social anxiety know that most people aren't overly critical, but they think that people might be thinking it even when they are too polite to say it. And also, most people with social anxiety have had experiences in their past of being bullied or humiliated or shamed by other people. It doesn't really matter to them if 99% of the people are kind and generous in their thoughts. They're afraid of the 1%. And even if you have them do ex experience experiences where they don't turn out badly, it doesn't reduce their social anxiety that much because they say yes, but the next time someone might be critical of me. I was working with this woman and we weren't making much progress over the first couple sessions. And around that time, I was getting ready to teach a class on phobia treatment. Social anxiety is a type of phobia, and I realized with phobias, we don't try to convince people that it's not dangerous. We instead try to help them learn ways to cope with whatever danger might exist so that they can approach with whatever, with what they're afraid of. So I came in and talked to this woman, and I said, you know, I'm thinking of maybe we're taking the wrong approach. And I put out the anxiety equation. I said, we've been working on your thoughts about how dangerous it is, but maybe if we could work on developing your confidence so you could cope with criticism and rejection, then it wouldn't be devastating to you. Maybe that would be more helpful. She kind of leaned forward in her chair. She got very interested in this, and this was actually the first person I worked with where I developed a method for treating social anxiety, which I call assertive defense of, of the self. And what's involved in this is I agree with the client that some people are going to be critical and rejecting of them. We don't even test out danger beliefs at all. Instead, what I do with them is I say, let's make a list of all the criticism and criticisms and rejecting things people can say or do. And we make those in a list on the left hand side of a page. And then on the right hand side of the page, I say, now let's imagine what you could say or do that would assertively defend themselves. And I start by teaching them what assertion, what assertion is. When someone criticizes you, you could, on the other hand, just take it in and feel devastated and say, oh, that's right, I'm a terrible human being, but that doesn't make you feel very good. That would be what we would call kind of passively accepting anything that anyone says about you. On the, other, on the other end of the extreme, you could be aggressive back and you could say, you think I'm weak. You're really weak. You're like the weakest person. Or if they say you're stupid, you could say you're stupider. You could attack them. That is putting the other person down. We don't want to put yourself down and we, and we don't want to put them down. We want to stay in the middle, which is, assert, which is assertion, which is where you can accept it. There, accept if there's some truth is what someone is saying about you, but you also, but you want to also stand up for yourself. So you might say, yes, that was pretty stupid what I just said, but I'm actually not a stupid person. If you get to know me, I think you'll find there's a lot of things to like about me. So that would be an example of an assertive statement. We took care of her critical things she was worried people would think or say about her. We developed assertive responses to those. And then in session, she and I started doing role plays where I would play the critic and I would read off her list and she would make assertive responses. And I would coach her because initially people don't do a very good job of assertively defending themselves. They kind of half-heartedly say, yeah, I suppose that was stupid. I'm not totally a stupid person. And so I coach them and say, make eye contact. Say it like you believe it. Let's act. Who's your favorite actor? How would they say if they were in a movie playing this role? Sorry, how would they say it if they were in a movie playing this role? And I get them to start to portray this role so they can actually be quite assertive with me in longer and longer role plays where I start upping the emotional intensity of the criticism. Well, after doing this for a couple of sessions in the office, I said, I think you're ready to go outside the office. So I gave her an assignment, which was much harder than those early assignments of just saying hello to someone. It was an assignment to collect rejections and hope that she got lucky and people actually said rejecting things to her so that she could assertively defend herself. And so the assignment that she and I came up with was that she was going to go to her college campus and when classes were changing and people were hurrying this way to get to the class, she would go this way and ask... People going the opposite direction, would you like to go get a cup of coffee? And our assumption was they'd all reject her and she could mentally imagine things that they would, that they were thinking about her. Like, what a social reject that she has to invite a stranger to coffee. And then she would assertively defend herself and say, well, you might think it's a social reject, but I don't know many people here. And, and, and it's a way to meet people, Dr. B. In this exercise, the client generally does the assertion in his or her mind, but sometimes someone actually does criticize the client's behavior. And when this happens, Christine lets the client know that they've just gotten lucky. Dr. Podesky. 
first they just look at me like, that would be lucky. Yeah, it would be lucky because look at how much more confident you got in here when I would criticize you. And then they get it and they say, okay. What surprised me is for as difficult as this assignment was, this was the first assignment in our work together this woman did. She went to campus that week. She invited a bunch of people walking the opposite direction to have coffee with her. She enjoyed doing it. She came back. She said, well, it was really interesting to do. I said, great. It turned out three of the five people had coffee with her, which we had not anticipated. I gave her a hard time about that. I said that that was not the experiment. That was not the experiment. That was not success. That was not successful. You were supposed to get rejected. But then she had chances to, in her mind, practice assertive defense of the self with those who didn't. And when she went for coffee with people, she had some real social experiences that were quite wide ranging and interesting, and it was extremely effective with her. And after that point, every person who's come to me with social anxiety, I use assertive defense of the self with them because I find that with some anxiety disorders, working on danger beliefs is the most helpful. Like with panic disorder, that's what we work on. Does a racing heart really mean you're going to have a heart attack? Let's test that danger belief out. With social anxiety and generalized anxiety disorder, I find working with people on increasing their confidence and their coping is much more effective than working on danger beliefs. So that's a way I've really changed my work as a CBT therapist over the years. Dr. B, when we're able to figure out what which part of the anxiety equation to tinker with, we can also tailor treatment to be more effective. This idea of the anxiety equation is an important one, and we'll circle back to it in Module 6. But before we jump ahead, Dr. Rick Hansen has a way of resourcing someone who is anxious, and his technique builds on the strategies we just heard from Christine. Here, Rick discusses one method for building up a client's internal resources. Dr. Hansen. There's actually a teaching from Shantideva of Tibet, Tibet, Tibetan Buddhism who said, the world is covered with sharp stones and thorns and brambles. What can we do about that? Well, we could either cover the world with leather or we could put on a pair of shoes. So it's that focus. Sorry, the world is covered with sharp stones and thorns and brambles. I said that weird. So it's that focus on building up internal resources yourself in terms of how to do that. I find it's helpful to name the threat and name the true threat, including the experience the person would have if the dreaded event occurred. Because we never really fear events themselves. We fear what we would feel generally as a result of the event. That's a major aspect of it. So to bring it back down to the experience, which then creates opportunity because the person's capacity to limit events and circumstances and relationships and relationships is pretty limited. But their ability to, rego to regulate the experiences they would have if the dreaded event occurred is really, really quite great. So naming what it is that they feel threatened by and then focusing on building up internal resources that are matched to the particular threat. And I thought she was extremely skilled, skillful in helping this particular person she was talking about, doing assertiveness, assertiveness tests and self, I forgot her exact term, self-defense tests with other people. It was really very, very inventive. So I think helping people build up resources in various ways. And then finishing, I've definitely had experiences with clients where I've gone down this road. We've identified the threat, we've built up the resources, and the truth is, deep down, they want to remain anxious about this particular thing because it serves some sort of function for them. <clears throat> and then we have to get at the deeper matter of, what does it do for you to be afraid of that thing? Because even though in a very good faith kind of way, we've gone down a road to try to deal with your anxieties about that particular thing. You're not really budging here. Okay, what's deeper? What's deeper? What's the function that's served by the fear? For example, a desire to remain in a dependent position in relationships because deep down in a person's mind, that's what creates relationship in the first place. And if a person were, deep, were truly independent and truly resourced and capable, then no one else would love them and take care of them. Dr. B. Clearly, anxiety is a complicated issue. Clearly, anxiety is a complicated issue. That's why understanding the balance of danger and resources can be critical. Understanding this balance can give us a way to take action that can make a powerful difference for our clients. Coming up in the next module, we'll, we will explore the common view of anxiety treatment that can hold our clients back.
I'll see you there.